Welcome Concrete Kitties, this is Tyler Lay, and in this episode, we're going to be talking about supplementary cementitious materials, another very critical tool for our use in concrete. Supplementary cementing materials, also known as SCMs. It's any material that, when used in combination with Portland cement, contributes to the properties of the hardened concrete through hydraulic or pozzolanic activity or both. What do I mean by that? Well, these are solids that you add to, and you take out cement, you reduce, or remove some amount of the cement, and you put this material in instead. And it helps your concrete, either by something called a pozzolanic reaction, or, some, or it's also a, a hydraulic cement. What am I talking about? Let's see. A pozzolan. That's any material that chemically reacts with calcium hydroxide. Do you remember calcium hydroxide? That's the stuff that's formed when C3S hydrates to form CSH, calcium silicate hydrate. The leftover stuff is calcium hydroxide. So we've got this leftover junk sitting in our concrete and the pozzolans will react with it. They actually have reactive silica and they will react to the calcium hydroxide to form more CSH. Oh, baby, that's awesome. And not only to that, but there's already a structure formed of CSH. It's a structure that already exists inside the concrete. So when this CSH forms, it's filling in the voids or the keyholes that are already there. That's like super engineered, like hydration, right? Isn't that awesome? The other one is hydraulic cements. These are any material that chemically reacts with water to form a compound with cementing properties, right? They're stable in water. You know about these. Again, these hydraulic cements, these SCMs that are hydraulic cements, they react and form after. They're slower reacting, and they're actually usually kicked off by the Portland cement. So once, once they form, there's already the Portland cement structure there. So they just kind of fill in the gaps. So it's a much more efficient reaction. So the, the types of SEMs are natural pozzolans, fly ash type F, fly ash type C, slag, and silica fume. And we'll be talking about the bottom four today. Fly ash, that's a fine powder that's a result of the combustion of pulverized coal. So you take coal, combust it up, or break it up, actually combust it in a coal-fired power plant to produce electricity. And the, the powder, the stuff that isn't combusted, the stuff that makes it through the whole process, is collected in the exhaust gas by something called precipitators. And typically, if we don't use this landfill, or it, if we don't use this material, it's sent to a landfill. It's not used in concrete or some other application. This is the by far the most widely used SCM. There are two types. There's class F, which is low calcium. You say, like, what's that mean? What's low calcium? Well, if it has less than about 20% calcium oxide content, then it's a class F. And if you have greater than 20% calcium oxide content, it's considered a class C. And again, these things are used as cement replacement. You take out some of your Portland cement and you put this material in. For class F, sometimes you'll see it used between 15 and 30%. For class C, you'll see it used anywhere between 15 and 40%. There's approximately 71 million tons of fly ash produced every year in the United States. And about I say 50% of it is used, should be the best way to say it. About 50% of all this fly ash is used, and I would say out of all of it, about 30% of it is used in concrete. 20% of it is used in other applications. So there's a lot of material, there's a lot of fly ash that still goes to the landfill. Historically, fly ash is a waste product, so it's less expensive than cement. It used to be 
way, way, when, when Flash very first started, they would pay you to take it. They would pay the cement plants. They would pay the ready-mix people to use it because it was better than taking it to a landfill. Then they didn't pay you, but it didn't cost you anything. And then it cost you a little, it cost you more. And in some regions, fly ash is so valuable to people that they pay as much of it for it as they do for cement, okay? So it just depends, but it's a valuable, valuable tool. And oftentimes it's less expensive than cement. So using it, we're going to find out that it's actually going to improve the performance of our concrete. It's also going to help with sustainability because we're keeping things out of landfills. Another big benefit of fly ash is that they're spherical in shape and they're about the same size as cement grains. So cement grains are a little bit more angular, almost more kind of like um, ellipses. And these are more spherical and so they help pack better. So they help with your flow and your workability. So they'll make it easier to get higher slumps or you could actually reduce your water content and get a lower water cement ratio. And it, if there's uncombusted carbon in the fly ash, then it will absorb the admixtures in the concrete. Yeah, that's not, that's not good, right? Especially if you have air and training admixtures, then this carbon will just suck it all up and it, it won't make it available to, to stabilize the bubbles. That's not good either. Class F and C fly ashes are totally different, and they have totally different performance. And that's because the coals that are burned are very, very different in Class C and Class F. These days, though, they often blend coals from different sources, so that makes our fly ashes even more complicated. But let's talk about class F first. Class Fs are pozzolans. That means they consume the calcium hydroxide. They take the stuff that we don't want. They take the stuff that's the byproduct of the reaction and they turn it into CSH. They turn it into a hydrated material that's going to give us strength. However, this doesn't happen quickly. It starts within a few days. You get some benefit, but to really see lots and lots of benefit, it takes months, okay, months. And this means the particles are largely inert. These are class F particles are largely inert during mixing and hydration. They don't, they don't do a lot. So they're gonna bring your heat of hydration down. They're gonna make it easier for your material to flow because they're not reacting or doing anything. There are these little spheres in there that help lube everything up. However, they are absolutely outstanding for durability. Class F reduces your fluid and ion penetration because they tighten up your pore structure. They react to the calcium hydroxide, make more CSH, and they make it harder for outside chemicals to come in. They also improve the performance of the concrete to resisting ASR and sulfate attack, both of those. And they do that mainly by diluting cement, okay? With ASR, they also consume calcium hydroxide, which will lower the pore solution pH, okay? Which makes ASR not as reactive. That's a different story for a different day. The long-term strength of these materials will also be very high, but long-term might be years. These are much more like b light type cements. By using a class F fly ash, you're kind of stepping back in time and you're using a cement that's more similar to the Roman cements, the ancient cements. Now let's talk about class F fly ash's twin brother, class C. They're very, very different, different from one another. Class C fly ash can be extremely variable depending on the source. Class C fly ashes with pretty high calcium oxide content, greater than 30%, they're mainly hydraulic cements. They're mainly just like a poor man's version of a Portland cement. They're usually activated by a Portland cement, as in the poor solution pH, the, the, the really caustic solution made by the Portland cement actually causes the fly ash to react. These Class C fly ashes that are between 20% and 30%, 
Now, they're interesting beasts. They're partially hydraulic and partially pozzolan. And actually, all fly ashes are this way. All of them have a combination of hydraulic cement characteristic and pozzolanic characteristics. And I guess what I'm trying to say here is that as you get closer to lower calcium, usually it's more pozzolanic. And when you get in this mid-range between 20 and 30%, it's kind of a blend. And if it's greater than 30%, it's mainly a cementitious material. Typical Class C ashes, those are the ones greater than 30%, have really good early strength gain. Pretty much the same as Portland cement. You really don't notice much difference between a 100% Portland cement mixture and one of these mixtures with a Class C fly ash. Now, they also reduce your fluid and ion penetration over mixtures with just OPC. Well, why does that happen again? I said it before, when, when OPC kind of forms this structure, then once the Class C fly ash starts to react, the structure's already in place. So when the new hydration products fill, form, they're gonna fill in some of those pores, some of those missing spots in the original structure from the OPC. And Class C ash may or may not help suppress ASR and sulfate attack. It's really a flip of a coin. We don't know what it's gonna do. And that's why testing is so important right now, at least until we figure more about fly ashes and how they work. Like fly ash, slag, our next SCM, comes from a waste product, from some kind of other industrial process. I mean, look at us, concrete, we're just using everybody else's waste to make our products better. How awesome is that? How awesome is that? Well, slag is a waste product from the iron refinement and steel manufacturing process. And what happens is, is that during the production of the steel, they actually inject limestone to help remove impurities and trap them in the slag. So they shove limestone particles up and they come up, they float up, they float up and they pull up the bad stuff out of the molten metal. And this slag is actually moved off the surface and this is really important. You have to quench it. You have to cool it very, very quickly. Why? Because you want to make it glassy. You want to make it amorphous. So you want to get the material off and you want to cool it with water jets. And then sometimes they'll have this drum, rotating drum, where they break it up. There's lots of different ways to try to produce slag, okay? And they've, they are always kind of refining that process to make it better. But the key is, is you want to get it cooled quickly and you want to break it up into small pieces so it can be ground in even smaller pieces. And this quick cooling, as I said before, is very, very important as an SCM because it determines the reactivity of the slag. You, again, you want it to be amorphous. So there's different grades of slag, 80, 100, and 120. And these correspond to different strengths, but they really kind of compare um, with Portland cement. So a grade 100 is gonna have very, very similar strength to 100% Portland cement. Grade 80 is gonna be about 20% less than Portland cement, and grade 120 is gonna be actually gain strength faster than a straight Portland cement. How is that possible? Because slag is a secondary cementitious material. Remember, it's the stuff that it waits till the OPCs formed a structure, and the slag kind of fills in the pores after that. I mean, how awesome, and what a great idea, right? But if you grind the slag fine enough, it'll actually give you even more strength than Portland cement does. So slags can have a lot of different impacts on actual concrete mixtures, and they can actually slightly improve the workability or make it about the same. They're a little bit different shape than Portland cement. So that can help some things sometimes, but sometimes you don't see any difference at all. But you almost always, you, you, you delay your set time because it's not as reactive early on as Portland cement. And that can be a good thing. It can be a very good thing. Your early strength gain is gonna go down, but your later strength gain is actually gonna be higher. And it's also actually gonna help you resist chlorides or, or other outside ions coming into your concrete or fluids, because it's gonna find those pores, those open spots in the Portland cement reaction, and it's gonna fill them in. 
one big thing is it's going to reduce your heat of hydration. So if you're building like a mass concrete element, that's like a big column or big wall or a big concrete dam or slab, and you don't want the concrete to get too hot. You don't want it to boil or you don't want it to be ruined. Okay. Then oftentimes we want to reduce the amount of heat it's given off. So I'm showing an isothermal calorimetry curve over here. This is time and this is the amount of heat given off. And here's 100% Portland cement. And using 25% slag, it's reduced my heat given off by about 20%. 50% slags reduced it by about 40%. So again, it's reducing the amount of early age heat given off because it's there's not as much Portland cement reacting early on. And that cement's that slag's gonna react later, but it's not gonna have as much exothermic reaction. It's gonna improve performance in alkali silk reaction and also resistance to sulfate attack. Our last SCM for today is silica fume. It's another waste product. This time, it's from the production of silicon. If we're talking about computer chips, and we know how prevalent they are, they're everywhere. And the exhaust gas from the silicon metal production produces SIO, and it combines with oxygen to form silicon dioxide. And the SIO2 condenses and forms these small droplets of what's called silica fume. And they're caught in something called filter bags. Typical characteristics of silica fume is it's about 85% silicon dioxide. So it's pretty pure. It's almost completely amorphous. That means there's almost no structure to it, okay? So it's extremely reactive. It has a very high surface area and they're spherical in shape. So silica fume particles are about 100 times smaller than cement grains, 100 times smaller. And so they can pack extremely well, extremely well with cement grains. And they also react with calcium hydroxide to form more CSH. So you get a lot of benefit out of these things. So this 100 times smaller in this packing is a huge deal. Let me show you what I mean. If I have a blend of 95% cement and 5% silica fume, and by the way, this is about the highest dosage that's used of silica fume. 5% makes the concrete extremely sticky. Um, but there's approximately 700,000 silica fume particles for every one cement particle. 700,000 silica fume particles for every one cement particle. And this can lead to extremely dense packing. What do I mean? If I have only cement, it looks like this. If I have this cement plus silica fume, look, I get, I get all these for every one of these particles, I got 700,000 smaller ones to like pack around it. Okay, so I mean, this is going to reduce the permeability. This is going to reduce the, the, the fluid transport. It, man, it is going to tighten the pore structure up. It's going to increase strength. Imagine trying to transfer load through this. Okay, all those little bitty particles are going to start contributing to the early age strength gain. They're going to they're going to spread load out and allow it to go through the system. They are very very beneficial. But there's bad news. Silica fume is pretty costly. Very, very expensive. It also greatly reduces the workability of the mixture. I mean, you're going to use heavy dosages of super plasticizers if you're using silica fume. And you also have to mix it extremely thoroughly because these silica fume particles ball up. Okay, So you have to mix very, very, very hard to disperse them and get them out. So there's some plus and minuses to silica fume. This is an image from a scanning electron microscope of the three SEMs that we've just been talking about compared to Portland cement. Now in all of these, the scale bar is exactly the same, 10 microns, okay? That's one fifth the size of a human hair. 
And we can see our fly ash particles. I said they were spherical. You can see them right here. And, they're, and here is Portland cement. Much more kind of oval-shaped type particles. Angular, long, long-shaped particles. And they about the same size. And we have slag particles down here. They're a little bit different shape than Portland cement. They have, again, they have a much, much similar size distribution. And here's silica fume. You might say, like, I don't see it. Yeah, remember? It's 200 times smaller than Portland cement. So we've got to zoom in even more to see it. This is what we're talking about. This is silica fume. Little, little, itty-bitty particles. This is a 500 nanometer scale bar down here. Okay? 500 nanometer scale bar. Again, 200 times smaller than what we were just looking at. So these very small silica fume particles, again, they cause a lot of water demand. They're, they're, they lower your workability. They make your concrete sticky, but they pack great and they give you good strength. Take care.